So I'm Rick Harnish. I'm the executive director of the High Speed Rail Alliance. Uh, thank you all for joining us today for this brown bag lunch. Uh, the High Speed Rail Alliance is a 501c3 nonprofit, and we work to be very knowledgeable about not only why we need high speed rail, about but what steps policy makers can take to make it happen here. We educate folks um, around the country about those things. And then we provide our members and the general public the tools they need to communicate why high-speed rail is important and what steps they want their legislators to take. Um, so uh, uh, as a little bit of, of back or uh, logistics, I'm not going to necessarily uh, respond to someone who raises their hand if you could put the questions and answers. Um, we will do that and feel free to put the questions and answers in as we go. Um, and then um, if you find this seminar or webinar or lunch uh, valuable to you, please go to hsrail.org and make a donation. And if you make a donation this week, we'll send you a face mask with our logo on it, um, which are very comfortable. So um, I wanna thank uh, Danny Plower for joining us today. He's the executive director of, of the Virginians for High Speed Rail out of Virginia. And they've done a tremendous amount of work to make huge progress in that state. And he's gonna to talk today about how, what progress is happening, what's up next and, and what he, his group did to help make it happen. So go ahead, Danny. Excellent, thank you, Rick. And uh, uh, thank you everyone. A little bit about uh, Virginians for High Speed Rail. We are also 501c3 nonprofit. We are a coalition of citizens, uh, localities, businesses and economic development groups that uh, also educate and advocate for high speed rail. Uh, and, and we are in the process of preparing to celebrate our 25th anniversary a little bit late um, because of the pandemic. So let me share my screen. Um, I hope uh, you all did not have too big of a lunch. If you did, I apologize. I'm probably going to put you asleep um, over the course. Um, so uh, Rick asked me uh, to speak a little bit about, you know, the track to uh, the Transforming Rail in Virginia program. Uh, with the governor's big announcement. Uh, let's make sure I can get this all work. There we go. Um, so this past December in 2019, which um, even though it's about a year away or, or, or a year past, uh, feels like about 50 years ago, um, our governor announced the uh, Transforming Rail in Virginia program. It is a $3.7 billion uh, program to purchase and expand uh, railroad right away across the state. Um, including buying 49% of the Richmond, Fredericksburg, and Potomac Railroad between DC and Richmond, uh, full ownership of the Buckingham branch between Clifton Forge and Doswell, a portion of which is what the Cardinal operates over. So we'll be, uh, uh, the state will be owning a portion of the railroad that the Cardinal operates on, as well as full ownership of the S line between Petersburg, Virginia and North Carolina border. Uh, total, we will be buying um, over 350 corridor uh, miles um, for about $525 million. Uh, to put that in context, the state of Virginia sold the RFMP in the early 1990s for 250 million. Uh, so uh, we are buying uh, half of it back for about essentially double the price. Um, so that, that really goes to show the lack of foresight sometimes of uh, politicians on, on what is gonna be needed over the next year, which is why uh, this is so important. Um, we're also building and maintaining state ownership of a second Potomac Railroad Bridge, the Long Bridge, um, costing about 1.9 billion. Uh, right now, the original bridge, the alignment of the railroad Long Bridge today goes back to pre-Civil War. Um, so it's been around for a little while. Uh, it's been a, been a railroad bridge uh, for about 120, 130 years. Um, and so we'll be buying and building a second span. Um, we're also building additional capacity along the DC to Richmond corridor, about 39 track miles um, for the cost of about 1.3 billion. And that includes a lot of um, rail bridges. And so that is why the cost is a little bit higher is uh, if you've ever looked at the RFMP, it crosses a lot of bodies of water. 
Um, all in all, over the next decade, we're looking at expanding our Amtrak regional service about 53%. Uh, increasing our commuter rail service by nearly 40%, including adding uh, late night and weekend service on commuter rail, which is something that we don't have today. So um, there's a tremendous amount of benefit for this program. Um, so these are uh, the corridors. The light blue one over in the western area of the state um, is the Buckingham branch. Uh, the burgundy reddish one is the RFMP. Uh, and the light blue one or the darker blue one going from the bottom half of the state is the S line. So this is essentially what Virginia is either buying all of or getting a portion of uh, across the state. Um, and this is what the service enhancements look like. Um, I know uh, Rick is gonna uh, talk about hourly service and, and that's really what the goal will be for the Richmond area. On the left-hand side, uh, you will see uh, the dark blue are our Amtrak regional trains. The orange are our um, national Amtrak national trains. Uh, and the light dot blues are all the additional trains and the extensions that we will be adding uh, over the next decade. And on the right hand side, that is all the additional uh, commuter rail service that we'll be adding as well. Um, and so there's a, there's a lot of potential new trains, uh, which is something that we've been working for for a while. Uh, and so getting on the fast track this past January, um, after the governor's announcement, we had uh, before the pandemic, what would have been considered probably, um, you know, our organizations as well as rail advocacy's uh, highest achievement. Uh, we were part of the partner or we were part of the coalition that helped reorganize Virginia's entire transportation funding system. Uh, it was a bill, just we called it the transportation omnibus. It ended up passing 77 to 59. That's both chambers of our General Assembly. Um, and what it did was it brought all the money uh, before this year, all the, our, our transportation funding was kind of a hodgepodge. You know, this little bit went to that, this little bit went to that. We brought it all together in a new Commonwealth Transportation Fund. Uh, and out of that 7.5% was dedicated to the new Commonwealth Rail Fund. And so now we have dedicated annual funding um, that essentially we don't have to go back to the General Assembly to beg hand in, hat in hand every year for rail funding. And that, that increased our rail funding 22% by bringing everything together. Uh, this was obviously pre-COVID, but, but rail was one of the biggest beneficiaries of this new um, overhaul. Uh, it increased our annual rail funding from 136.5 million to 167 million, and that money would continue to grow as gas taxes go up or sales tax, as that generates more revenue, this would have generated more revenue for rail as well. It also did something that our organization has been pushing for for nearly 20 years, uh, which is it created a passenger rail authority. Uh, Virginia's state constitution is weird in that the only two things that the state is technically allowed to own uh, in regards to transportation is uh, public parks and roadways. And so anytime the state invested in anything outside of public parks or roadways, it had to make the argument that those projects benefited one of those two things. Uh, and so frequently in Virginia, when we talked about rail investments, we talked about taking cars off the road. And that was because of a limitation in the way the state could own infrastructure. Uh, and so by creating a passenger rail authority, because it's a semi-governmental organization, um, it does not have to fully abide by the state's constitution on ownership of infrastructure. And so this authority will allow the Commonwealth to own and maintain rail right away, as well as infrastructure and contract for passenger rail operations. And so this is a game changer. 93% of every dollar for, from the Commonwealth Rail Fund will automatically go to the rail authority to invest, expand, improve, and sustain our passenger rail. So that's a huge game changer. Uh, that we're very excited about. Um, and, and the last thing that we really got out of this past General Assembly is my little baby, uh, which is the Commonwealth Corridor study. Uh, we got a state study looking at the feasibility of adding East-West passenger rail service here in Virginia uh, that will be completed at the end of 2021. Uh, and this is something our organization has been pushing for um, really for probably the last six or seven years. Um, we have no cross-state service today. If you want to take a train from, you know, Western Virginia and Roanoke and get over to Eastern Virginia and Hampton Roads, it takes 13 hours uh, by train 
and it would take you about three, four hours by car because you would have to go Roanoke all the way up to DC, transfer in DC and come back down to Hampton Roads. And so um, this Commonwealth corridor, which is the dark green on this map, looks at bringing back east-west service here to Virginia uh, for the first time in nearly 40 years. Um, and so we're very excited. That little dotted line between Charlottesville and Richmond is along the Buckingham branch, uh, which the state just happened to be in the process of buying. Um, so obviously we're very excited about that uh, because that's, that puts the Commonwealth corridor one step closer to becoming a reality and coming to fruition. Uh, but this is something that we've been pushing for a little bit. Um, and, and we see this as an opportunity of creating a little bit of redundancy in our passenger rail network um, so that, you know, should something happen, uh, we're going to have more opportunities to get across the state so that uh, passenger rail becomes as reliable as other modes. Um, so getting back, getting on the fast track, um, uh, this past September, the Long Bridge study, the, the federal EIS was completed. The project now moves to shovel ready. Uh, this October, the Passenger Rail Authority meets, met for the first time um, and, and really got set up. And this past November, Virginia received an FRA grant uh, for $14.4 million at, from the Federal State Partnership for Good Repair uh, to replace a bridge as part of the Transforming Rail in Virginia program. And so that big program that I talked about a little bit earlier that the governor announced, we've begun getting federal grants to help advance it a little bit. <clears throat> So getting the train moving. Um, here's a picture of my good friend, uh, Rick Harnish, when he came and spoke to uh, Virginians for High Speed Rail in 2007. Um, and, and he told our audience, I think it was 150, 200 people about how you know he, he traveled up and down the state um, eating chicken dinners and speaking to Rotary Clubs and Qantas Clubs. And that's really uh, sparked uh, you know, my approach and our approach at Virginians for High Speed Rail about our advocacy. So how do we get here? First of all, we listen to others on how they were successful, um, including my friend Rick um, and others that, that had, uh, you know, feet on the ground experience with getting new trains, um, doing the little things to put, you know, their states, their regions in a position uh, to be successful. Uh, because you don't know what you don't know until you listen to others who have been there and done that. Um, and so, you know, I'm glad to pay Rick back, um, you know, a couple, about a decade and a half later um, in, in speaking to your organization. Um, but, you know, his, his advice and his insight was very, very instrumental. Um, second, um, you know, we created our goals and vision. Um, and so in 2008, we sat down and we said, you know, what do we want to accomplish and, and how do we begin accomplishing it? So, you know, our, our goal was to increase our daily regional trains from four to 18, make our trains automobile competitive uh, by reducing trip times by up to 35%. That means you can get from Richmond to DC faster than you could driving. It doesn't have to be double the time um, or, or half the time of driving. We just wanted to make sure that there was a reliable alternative to the car. First and foremost, increasing reliability and on-time performance above 90% and then also connecting 80% of Virginians, um, which was a big thing for us. So spreading the service out so we get a lot of buy-in. And the way we do that is we collect a lot of data and, and travel to share the gospel. I've uh, enjoyed my share of rubber chicken dinners at Rotary and Kiwanis and Chambers of Commerce and environmental groups uh, at all different times of day and night, uh, obviously before the pandemic. Uh, but I'll talk a little bit about how we share or how we collect that data and, and what we find has been invaluable for us. And lastly, our second to last, uh, we always stick to our game plan. And anytime we approach something, we always try to approach it of how does it fit within our vision and goals as an organization and as advocacy group. And then lastly, uh, we sometimes we get into a little bit of good trouble. Um, and thanks to uh, the great Congressman John Lewis um, for that phrase, and I'll get into that a little bit as well. So we collect lots of data and, and travel to share the gospel. Um, one of the pieces of data that we collect are passenger rail data, ridership by train station, passenger miles, seat miles, ridership demographics. We collect environmental data, including uh, passenger miles traveled, gas usage, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, economic data, um, transportation data, including highway capacity here in Virginia, 
the cost of building new highways, airline capacity, travel costs, et cetera. Um, and we take this data and we travel across the state and speak to anybody and everybody that wants to have us um, and, and try to tell the story, not only from a statewide perspective, but also from their own regional perspective, if it's a rotary club or a chamber, et cetera. And so one of the examples of successful travel data that we that I always like to use um, is that traffic on Virginia's highways has increased 74% since 1980. Um, this little chart on the right shows our vehicle miles traveled per highway lane mile. And all this data comes from verified sources. This comes from the Federal Highway Administration uh, in the Virginia's Department of Transportation. And so according to uh, VDOT here in Virginia, the cost of an average highway lane mile is $44.2 million. And so if you were to extrapolate that out and say, what would it cost to pave our way back to 2000? Uh, we would need to add over a thousand highway lane miles at a cost of nearly $46 billion um, across the state. And we use this data in speeches, public comments, op-eds, and really we just pounded the drum and, and we put it everywhere and every, out there across the spectrum. And one of the things that happened from us pounding this drama and people saying, well, we think you're wrong. Um, and, and, you know, our organization saying, you know, look at it yourself, is the state actually did a highway corridor study for DC to Richmond. And what they found um, after spending, you know, I think it was three or $4 million to do this quarter study uh, is that the Oncog I-95, which is the major interstate, would be $122 million per lane mile to unlock gridlock and to get the highway from red during peak travel times, just the yellow, and that after spending something in the range of, uh, I think it was 13 or $14 billion um, on a new, you know, two new lanes north and two new lanes south, uh, traffic would return and be worse than it was within a decade. And so that study came out about, you know, six months before the governor made his big announcement. But it just goes to show how this data can really have a positive impact for rail uh, when you share it and you share it correctly uh, and you show the comparison about how um, you know we need to do other things. We need to have a true multimodal transportation system. And so we always stick to the game plan. Every action we take, as I said, is targeted to achieving our vision and goals. And this is how our priorities usually break down. We focus on local, regional, state, and federal plans. So if our, if a locality is, is doing a comprehensive transportation plan, we try to submit public comments and get our supporters in that locality to say, hey, we need to upgrade or add a train station. Uh, when it comes to federal and state studies, uh, Pat Simmons, who used to head the rail department in North Carolina, who really did a lot of game-changing work down there, um, he told me once his goal in North Carolina was to get everything to shovel ready, have everything studied, reviewed, have everything um, ready to go so that when era came available and they in north carolina got 600 million dollars in 2008 9 um, is because they had everything shovel ready and so uh, i've taken that approach you know listening to other people smarter than myself um, and, and been pushing the same thing here in virginia let's get all our studies done let's get ready to go we also focus on a lot of small projects too chipping away until we can take advantage of big opportunities adding a stoplight extending a train uh, fixing the signs, directing people to our stations, uh, and doing station improvements to make sure they have modern amenities like Wi-Fi and that it's comfortable. And then all those little medium, small things really kind of put us in a position for the large projects like the Transforming Rail in Virginia initiative of adding new trains and doing major investment because we've gotten all the low-hanging fruit. You know, we've crossed all our T's and dotted our I's from our perspective. And then lastly, uh, you know, if necessary, we'll take action, legislative or otherwise, um, outside of any governmental group um, or agency or entity. Um, and so what that basically means is, you know, occasionally we run into headwinds. Uh, the Commonwealth Quarter Study was initiated by us. I approached legislators with the study, asked them to put it in the General Assembly um, outside of our Department of Rail. Um, and I've done that in the past. Sometimes uh, in partnership with them, sometimes in opposition. Um, but basically, you know, our goals, um, you know, if we run the headwinds uh, from agencies or bureaucrats, sometimes we, we go up the next ladder to legislators ourselves. 
and talk about why this is important to their districts and their constituents. Um, and we've been successful. And uh, truthfully, the, the current Department of Rail and Public Transportation of Virginia has been doing a great job. We have a great partnership with them. We work closely. Um, and so we haven't had to go uh, too far out on a ledge ourselves. But in previous departments we had, we've had to go um, really kind of fight tooth and nail to get things through outside um, of our own Department of Rail. And sometimes I imagine that a lot of you have to do likewise. Um, I have found out in the Southeast, not in Virginia necessarily, but a lot of rail departments are, are staffed by former road builders who don't understand why rail is valuable. And sometimes you got to beat that drum um, and go around them to get things done. Um, so how do we get here? Um, you know, in 2007, Amtrak released a report, um, and I won't go through all these. I'll try to hit the highlights, um, outlining potential two new regional trains. And really, we went across the state. We nailed I think 25,000 postcards, spoke to every community group um, about our vision and about getting new, two new trains up and running. In 2009, we were successful. We got the new Lynchburg train. Um, then we wanted to figure out how we funded it and we passed a net legislative study uh, that led to uh, IPROC uh, in 2011, the Virginia Passenger Rail Fund, um, which we helped get ded dedicated funding for in 2013. Uh, in 2010, we got our, our second regional train, the Richmond one, are launched, um, and then that was extended to Norfolk. Um, in 2017, that Lynchburg train was extended to Roanoke. And then in 2019, earlier last year, uh, a second Richmond regional was extended to Norfolk. So um, a lot of this is just chipping away, um, doing little things here and there, um, trying to move the ball uh, down the field uh, and make progress. And and you know, that's the one thing that we ha as rail advocates really have to remember is, um, you know, transportation projects take a long time. Uh, and sometimes our communities and the public don't necessarily see all the advocacy done to plant those seeds in the first place for it to get to that process of fruition. And so, you know, how are we doing? Um, over the last decade, we've increased passenger rail service 31%. We've seen our ridership increase 71%. Uh, we've connected uh, or we've given 6.8 million Virginians new or improved uh, rail service. That's generated about 6.9 billion in economic benefits, uh, reduced about a million uh, metric tons of CO2 and greenhouse gas emissions, reduced vehicle miles traveled and reduced fuel consumption. Um, and so here's my plug um, before I move on to take questions. Um, we're celebrating our 25th anniversary uh, next Friday, um, you can buy tickets for $25 um, at VHSR.com backslash luncheon. Uh, Wick Mormon, the former CEO of Norfolk Southern and Amtrak, is our keynote, um, and he'll really be giving what he thinks the opportunities of uh, rail are going to be um, over the next decade. Um, and so you can watch either via Zoom or YouTube. Um, so I hope that you'll take an opportunity to participate and join us and help us celebrate um, our organization and all the work that we've done. Um, and with that, I will uh, start taking any questions. Excellent. Thank you, Danny. Um, uh, we will put the link to your event in the event notice on our event page. Um, so we'll get started with questions. I don't think we'll need to go back. So if you could unshare your screen, that would probably oh, okay. make more sense. Um, excellent. So first question out of the box um, is what about faster speeds? So let's tie in several questions that all relate. What about electrification, converting to uh, full high level platforms and closing grade crossings to get faster than uh, 150 is what the question is. Um, I, I don't know about 150, uh, just because there are portions of uh, the DC to Richmond corridor that you'll still have to go through a small town named Ashland. Um, but, you know, the goal of the, the uh, transforming rail in, in Virginia initiative is so that the state can control its own transportation destiny. Uh, and what that means from, you know, the Secretary of Transportation, what she has told me is their goal is to have a completely dedicated passenger rail corridor between Richmond and DC. Um, all the studies 
um, allow for electrification, including over the new Long Bridge. Um, the, the corridor between Raleigh and uh, Petersburg, Virginia, the S line that I mentioned earlier, is also engineered to allow for future electrification. Um, so that is certainly a possibility a little bit down the road and, and maybe sooner rather than later, depending on you know, prices of gas or fuel or, or other things. And so that is something that we're certainly pushing. Um, and it's something that could be very well a reality once we get to that point where uh, we have full grade separation between our passenger and freight rails. Um, for the next decade though, um, the state is projecting that there will be portions of the quarter that are shared. Okay. Um, which portions of it? How much? Uh, primary, well, uh, primarily Northern Virginia are the first uh, slate of projects that are going to be constructed and separated. Um, but as the project is built out further closer to Richmond, where there's less rail congestion and roadway congestion and transportation congestion overall, um, when the corridor is fully built out and the DC to Richmond high speed rail uh, program has been fully realized, there will be great separation between the two. Okay. Um, I, can you talk about Ashland? We, we talked about that before we actually got started. Can you go through that again? And maybe share um, this So Ashland is a, a unique uh, situation. Um, you know, before, um, as the DC to Richmond High Speed Rail program got moving forward, there are two tracks that essentially go through this small town a uh, beautiful little town. Um, everyone had come to, together, agreed that there would be a Western bypass for freight rail um, until uh, we got to nearly, the study was nearly complete. Um, and then there was uh, some opposition from the Western part, uh, which is very sparsely populated, um, but very vocal. Um, and so, you know, they put a lot of pressure on the town of Ashland to uh, support their effort to kill the Western bypass. Uh, and they, they successfully accomplished that. Um, and so right now, uh, regrettably, it's going to be a major uh, rail block uh, of our freight trains. We're gonna have three to four tracks feeding into a small town with two tracks that is at level at grade crossing um, or at grade with the town itself. Um, so I encourage you to Google, uh, if you're not sure what I'm talking about, Ashland, Virginia rail, um, and, and you'll learn what I'm, what I'm uh, discussing. Um, it, it's a very unsafe uh, situation. Um, and so hopefully, uh, yes, this is, uh, this is what we're dealing with. And so this is probably one of the major hindrances for our opportunity uh, to get true high speed rails because of uh, this situation. Um, you can imagine in, you know, 20 years when there's a lot of trains um, and a lot more need, uh, barriers being built on both sides of these tracks uh, and essentially cutting this poor town in half um, because the cost of tunneling underneath was something in the range of a billion dollars um, or half a billion dollars for a handful of miles. And so um, ideally we would have done the Western bypass, but I imagine uh, by the time that opportunity arises again, the Western part of the county, which is uh, fairly rural today, will be much more developed. Uh, and so we will probably lose that possibility, regrettably. So this is one of those keys where it's like, uh, we really need a bigger, bigger federal program yeah. so that we can deal with these issues in a way Absolutely. that makes the locals happy. Um, Yuri brought up um, in a different way, um, he perceives that, that this is a lot of infrastructure investment for not adding much service. Um, can you talk about that again and, and how we talk about it as hourly service, but um, just... um, It is, but it's also positioning Virginia for the next century. Uh, the, the vast majority of the cost, aside from buying the right of way, uh, is building the new Long Bridge, which um, is more than just one bridge. I believe it's six different bridges feeding into the District of Columbia. Uh, we're going through National Parkland. Um, and so uh, that cost is $1.9 billion uh, to build that infrastructure. Bridges are just expensive uh, and they're even more expensive when you're trying to get around the Pentagon, go through uh, different assets, um, especially those that are near national security and you're going through historic areas in the, in the District of Columbia. Um, so the primary cost is building this bridge. And, and while what we get over the next decade is not a lot, 
that does not mean that we are inhibited from what comes in the next two or three decades, which is, um, I believe, nearly doubling our passenger rail service, true hourly service. I think 18, 19 trains between DC and Richmond, um, 15 to 20 trains out of Hampton Roads. Um, so we are we are looking at a tremendous amount of additional service. So, um, you know, we're paying up front. It's, it's basically the down payment on a house. Um, we're putting the down payment on a very expansive um, rail program. And it just so happens that, you know, what we're getting out of it uh, over the next decade um, is still, we think, uh, significant. I think the opportunities over the next two decades are even greater. Um, uh, kind of off topic a little bit from <laughs> anonymous. <laughs> Uh, Hyperloop, how do you just, when somebody brings up Hyperloop, what do you say? <laughs> um, Hyperloop is interesting, um, but the question becomes, where's the right-of-way? Um, you know, if right-of-way was free or cheap, I think Rick and I would be retired because high-speed rail would be built across the United States and we there would be no need for a high-speed rail alliance or Virginians for high-speed rail or whatever because we'd be able to build it. The, the truth is that right away is the most expensive part of any major transportation projects, especially rail, uh, where we are trying to figure out how we go back into urban centers. Um, you know, I always tell a story of my grandfather who fought in World War II, when he got out, he worked at the Pentagon and his job was logistics. Uh, and he always said his job was to figure out how to get uh, toothpicks, toilet paper and tanks from any point in the United States to another point within two days. Um, and so I asked him once uh, before he passed away why Europe had high-speed rail uh, and America didn't. And he said, and, and you know, he was very, he was an Irishman and he was very blunt. He said, well, they had a small international conflict in the 1940s that allowed them to reimagine and redevelop their communities in a much better way. Um, so following World War II and all the devastation and destruction really allowed Europe to kind of come back and say, this is how we want to redevelop our communities. And that's primarily why a lot of their communities have rail, because they were able to go back and do it. Whereas America, you know, we, we got addicted to the automobile, to the car and the highways. Um, and, and, you know, Eisenhower, we never looked back, uh, regrettably. Um, and so, you know, we are dealing with the challenges of the decisions of our forefathers um, and how do we reconnect our communities by rail and so it's just astronomically expensive and so for hyperloop or maglev or for any of the others um, you show me the the free right away um and, and and you know i'll be i'll be glad to have a conversation <laughs> i i that is the crux of the issue is the right of way where you actually got to put this stuff right so yes that's a very good answer i appreciate that um, let's see here, Scott, I, I, Scott Rogers is, uh, is a, uh, a very effective rail advocate out of Low Carroll, Wisconsin. And he's saying that high-speed rail has gone out of vogue. Scott, I, I just, I have to say that that's not a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> uh, so let me read his question to you, Craig. Congratulations on your progress. In some quarters, the term high-speed rail has gone out of vogue. You have it in your name. Any comments? We we have discussed. I think probably many organizations um, with the high-speed rail in our names. Whether or not we should change it, we should keep it. Uh, my board and 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 my bosses and uh, we've always decided that we need a vision for something. Um, you know, outside of the United States, it's still called high-speed rail. Um, and so if we're aiming for something, uh, we should aim high. And so we continue to believe in high-speed rail. It may have gone out of vogue, uh, but that does not mean that it's not something that we're still trying to achieve. Um, you know, we're, we're aiming to be perfect and uh, be robust. Uh, and we chip away and hopefully one day we'll realize European-style high-speed rail, but, but we have a long way to go to make that a reality. But that doesn't mean that we can't dream and, and work hard towards our goal. Yeah, and I would build on that and say our friends, the people who want to support trains in large yeah. part, think high-speed rail. It's our yes. enemies that want us to think that high-speed rail is not both. So why would we have kowtowed to our enemies? 
but thank you for that question, Scott. I really appreciate that. Um, rolling stock, the actual train sets. Um, is Virginia planning on purchasing any of any of its for its Amtrak service? Um, we don't directly purchase. Uh, we partner with Amtrak on the purchasing. Um, you know, one of the benefits that I have that not a lot of other state advocates have is we can pull trains directly off the Northeast Corridor. Um, and so that has really been to the great benefit of, of Virginians overall is um, Washington Union Station is heavily congested with rail traffic. Um, and so one of the benefits to Amtrak uh, of having Virginia service is be able to pull those trains across the Potomac when we get a new Long Bridge and have them terminate and turn around here in Virginia and then go back north. Um, and so a lot of what we're trying to accomplish are just extending Northeast regional trains. Um, I know Virginia has set money aside and requested federal grants um, for additional rolling stock for Northeast corridor trains. Um, we invest something in the range of five to $6 million a year in updating, maintaining uh, Northeast corridor rolling stock. Um, so we really, from our perspective, it's we're, we're partnering with Amtrak to make sure that whatever we operate is compatible with the Northeast corridor and vice versa. Um, and kind of building on that, um, the service expansions have come without significant increase in operating support from the state. Um, and true. why is that? It's a good thing, why is it? Um, primarily twofold. I think uh, the Lynchburg Regional Train actually operates in the black for Virginia. Um, so Virginia makes, I think, something around a half million dollars off the Lynchburg Regional Train. Uh, from Amtrak and from users. Um, and according to Amtrak, if you look to the monthly performance report before the pandemic, all of our trains operated in the black, according to Amtrak. Uh, now, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, fancy different contract agreements between the states and Amtrak and what percentage of what they get in ticket sales and whatnot. Um, but overall, because of the high ridership and the growing ridership uh, and our trains operating well, um, that has allowed Virginia to focus primarily on infrastructure because our operating costs have not increased as much as uh, one would think because they're, Virginians love their trains. They're riding them. They were riding them. So a lot of the railroading is very capital intensive. So the key is to get a lot of people on every train yep. um, and then uh, make sure that they turn well. And because you're just an extension of the Northeast Corridor, you know, trains are better used and the crews are better used. Um, can you talk about the, they've been looking into trains that can run both under wire at high speeds on the corridor um, and not have to change to run diesel south of DC. Are you aware of what's happening? Yes, the, the, the dual mode engines yeah. um, or the bi mode engines, um, I think is the more popular uh, term nowadays. Um, yeah, so Virginia signed um, a request with Amtrak, I believe to the Federal Railroad Administration for somewhere in the range of 500, 600 million dollars um, to upgrade um, to some bi-mode or bi-energy um, train sets that would essentially, instead of right now today, a diesel train goes into DC, the diesel comes off, they put an electric train set on and the electric train set goes north to New York and Boston. Um, but that switch takes anywhere from 45 to an hour. Uh, 45 minutes to an hour. And so uh, by having dual mode or, or bi-mode uh, trains, um, essentially you turn one off, you turn the other on, uh, and it cuts the trip in DC down by you know half or a quarter. Um, and so it really speeds up. Uh, we are supporting that initiative. And one of the reasons going back to that electrific electrification question is you could imagine as we're building out DC Richmond, uh, Virginia partners with North Carolina and builds out Raleigh um, to Petersburg, Virginia, um, and that could be electrified. You know, Raleigh to Charlotte could be electrified, um, and so we could have electrification DC North, electrification Petersburg, Virginia South, um, and so we could have these engines where you turn one off, turn the other one on, and then when you get to Petersburg, you do the same thing, and then you go, you know, 110, 120 miles an hour south into North Carolina. Um, and so uh, we're really pushing that as an opportunity to get, get towards electrification sooner rather than later um, as we build out all these different projects. 
so that leads to the next two questions, which were, um, uh, so North Carolina has made progress on, the, on rebuilding the S line. Can you talk about that real quick? Yes. Uh, so they have built some of it. Um, I believe that they are finalizing their agreement with, so there's a large section of the S line between Petersburg and Raleigh that has been abandoned um, that Virginia is purchasing. And I believe North Carolina is purchasing um, their stake as well of this abandoned portion. And so um, when all those agreements are finalized, Virginia and North Carolina will own the entire S line uh, between Petersburg to Raleigh. Um, so they have made some improvements. I, I'm not fully aware on everything that's happened in North Carolina um, recently, um, but I know that uh, Virginia is working with them to get those, get that S line uh, fully purchased and under state control. Uh, Virginia can't own uh, property, at least according to our constitution in other states at the time, at this time. There's, um, so I guess we should clarify, there's, there were two competing railroads, the Atlantic coastline and the seaboard coastline. And so when uh, they merged, the seaboard coast mainline got downgraded in some places uh, abandoned yep. and that's called the S line. Yep. And so the states are working to rebuild that as a state owned um, passenger dedicated mainline. Yep, and, and that will cut the time between uh, Raleigh and Richmond down, I believe, 30 minutes um, by switching trains um, over to that corridor when it's fully up and running at a, at a minimum, I believe, 30 minutes. Um, and I, I would assume that they're talking about much more frequent service on that corridor. Yes. Well, uh, and, and as part of the, you know, the, I talked about 20 years out, I believe it is projected for six trains coming up from North Carolina. Um, through Richmond, Virginia, and, and over the Long Bridge as part of um, that entire project as well. So, um, you know, all these additional trains, um, although they're not uh, in that graphic that I showed you over the next decade, they are, you know, in the projections for the next uh, 20 years. And they may happen sooner if there's a robust federal program um, that comes out of hopefully the next Congress or some Congress shortly thereafter. But all these assumptions that Virginia is making are, is, are projects that they can accomplish by themselves without federal support. And that's really sad. And I think that gets to, you know, what, what Rick and I always work on day in and day out is try to create a robust federal program so states like Virginia don't have to go their own um, to get these big massive projects done and accomplish sooner than a decade. Yes, much sooner. <laughs> uh, so um, let's see here. We have lots of questions and we're not going to get through all of them. So I'm, I wanna make sure to see if there's any themes. Um, so um, here's one that has been asked a couple of times. Um, and I don't know how to answer it. So the, this, the general thought is that the railroads are hostile to passenger trains. They're privately owned class one railroads. Um, so how does that fit into the existing, that's how you, end, so tell me about how the state came to buy the right of way, I guess, and how that fits into this perception of, of the hostility of the railroads. So um, who's the former uh, CEO of CSX that passed away that had the, uh, the precision, the precision time management or oh, whatever? Yeah. Um, so Virginia approached CSX, you know, they, the Long Bridge study was advancing, um, you know, they had all these, you know, we got the new Richmond train, we were extending service, we had dedicated funding. And so Virginia approached after we finished the DC to Richmond, um, program and said, you know, what would it take to allow us to start building it? Well, shortly after they started the conversation, Hunter top or Hunter Harrison, um, was I believe the person who was heading CSX passed away. Um, and the people who took over CSX, um, and this is the story that, that I've been told and I won't share who, who shared those with me, um, was after he passed away, CSX got taken over by basically bankers and Wall Street folks, non-railroaders. Um, and instead of you know Virginia building all this infrastructure, they came back and said, hey, why don't you just buy it from us? 
Um, you know, we're coal traffic is down. You know, our projections are coal is going to decline by double digits over the next decade. We don't need all this additional infrastructure. Um, we've begun selling rail, you know, rail corridors around the country. Why don't you buy this all this excess wrap, um, right away from us and give us, you know, five hundred million dollars that we can then send to our shareholders and they are happy. We're happy. Um, and so that's basically how it happened. I, my understanding is Virginia was a little dumbstruck, was surprised, but, um, you know, they got on the ball and started finalizing all the agreements and got it signed, um, fairly quickly, you know, a, a, a um, memorandum of, uh, MOU and memorandum of understanding, um, uh, of this project. And so it, it was partially just kind of, um, dumb luck. Um, you know, things falling into place. Um, but hopefully that is the perspective of, um, you know, other railroads that have this excess capacity that maybe see the same thing as, um, you know, expanding that way by selling it to state entities, which is what we're hoping in Virginia. Uh, but uh, I don't know, as you were saying that, I'm sorry, I'm trying to read these and, and listen to what you're saying. Um, I just was thinking the immediate trigger was uh, Union Pacific and BNSF are requiring pretty substantial crash walls um, between the high speed tracks and their freight tracks um, in, uh, in California uh, for high speed rail. And so you've still got the issue of the private owners don't want the liability of, of passenger trains right next to their tracks where they frequently, much frequently there than is acceptable, will put yeah. trains and, on the ground. And I think in, in regards to the difference between California and Virginia a little bit is, um, you know, they're going to be going much faster than I think what we are. Um, you know, we will be limited for the most part to, you know, assets that run over the Northeast corridor. Um, and so I believe if I remember correctly, the, the trains in California projected to go a little bit faster than those on the Northeast uh, by a smidgen or two. Just a um, by about a, So, um, you know, that is our limiting factor um, in regards to speed. So I don't think we're, we're running into as many of those liability issues um, as California uh, is. Okay. Um, and then can you talk again, Phil is asking again about the East-West service. Can you clarify that again? Yes. You're doing a study on it. Yes. The, um, so the, the Virginia Department of Rail and Public Transportation are doing a feasibility study on what we're calling the Commonwealth Corridor, uh, essentially connecting Hampton Roads uh, through Richmond over to Charlottesville and down to Roanoke and New River Valley and, and potentially down to Bristol as well. Um, looking at returning that service um, into operation. It, the, the one part of that uh, corridor that does not have passenger trains today uh, between Richmond and Charlottesville is, is being purchased by the state as part of uh, this big transforming rail initiative that I've talked about. So, um, you know, the study's underway. Um, you know, I, we submitted some public comments and, and there will be a formal public comment period, I think a little bit later this year. Um, but you know, we'll definitely send stuff out for folks to encourage the, the voice their opinion. But I, I think the, the study will be uh, very favorable and, and hopefully the opportunity will rise to start building it out. Uh, Rick, you're on mute. On mute, sorry about that. <laughs> um, uh, real quick, uh, will all or some of your stations have rental car facilities that are open to, during times that are matching the, the times that the trains are there. Um, what type of facilities? Uh, rental car. I am not sure. Um, so Virginia takes the approach that, you know, they'll build the infrastructure, they'll build the tracks, they'll, they'll, you know, run the trains, but the stations are primarily the local contribution to this program. Um, so what happens at the stations um, is usually up to um, the local government if that is something that they want to do. I believe in Williamsburg, they do have some type of rental car facility. Um, I think there's something nearby in Richmond Main Street Station. Um, but uh, I, I know that we obviously advocate for a lot of last mile stuff connecting the transit, 
better um, bike and car and, and other modes. Um, but but I am not 100% sure what the uh, plans are for every station. I imagine um, that if that is desired, that they'll make that a reality. That's one of the frustrations we have, I have personally. Yeah. Here is how do you get a rental car downstate in Illinois? I agree. And Virginia does partner with Uber and Lyft. Um, and so if you take a regional into Virginia, there's a special discount code they'll give you to give you, I think, 25 or 30% off an Uber or Lyft um, from the station to your destination. So um, there is some partnering that's happening here in Virginia with uh, maybe not a rental car, but uh, with taxis or Uber or Lyft. Okay. Um, a number of people corrected me. It's Seaboard Airline, uh, <laughs> not Seaboard Coast. Airline, normally in the, when, before there were airlines, that meant it was the faster, straighter railroad which is why it's good that it's being turned into a dedicated passenger. Yes. <laughs> um, and then last, uh, you kind of hit on some of the issues with folks who might not think we should have passenger trains. Um, a couple of folks have asked about what kind of experience you've had, what kind of opposition you've had and, and what you've done to, to overcome it. Um, be as bipartisan as humanly possible. Uh, we, we work uh, very hard to cultivate uh, as diverse a set of coalition partners as humanly possible. Um, when, when we did the uh, Commonwealth Corridor legislation, um, our co-signers were Chambers of Commerce, Environmental Group, Labor Unions, and we even got the College Advocacy Group um, here in Virginia, the Higher Education Coalition, uh, the, the cosign as well, because the East-West Corridor serves so many of our higher education institutions. Um, and a lot of young people don't have cars uh, here in Virginia. And so um, we brought, we try to bring as much diverse coalition together as possible. Um, we, we do run into opposition, especially from, you know, the NIMBY types um, who, who don't want it, um, don't want it in their backyard, don't think that it's necessary, that nobody's ever going to ride it. Um, you know, one of the big things that we are always fighting about or fighting against, um, you know, being the termination point means that, you know, a train could arrive at the station with, you know, 10% full seats at the end of the night, so to speak. Um, and so people will use that as an example of why we don't need passenger trains, because only 10% of the seats are full at the last stop. Uh, when in reality, you know, they don't see, you know, the train getting full up in Northern Virginia when it stops at Fredericksburg and D.C. And by the time it arrives at Union Station, a lot of our regionals um, are packed and you could barely have a seat at all. And so, um, you know, we're, we fight a lot against that. And so um, going back to the data, we just we collect a lot of data to counteract um, any of these, you know, naysayers arguments about why this is needed. The simple fact is in Virginia, we're not gonna pave our way out of traffic. And so if we don't have a diverse transportation system, um, we're just gonna be sitting in gridlock, which is gonna kill everything else, our, our economy, our environment, et cetera. So um, that's how we get around it is, is we just, we write reports, we give speeches, we talk to legislators, uh, and we try to build a very strong bipartisan coalition uh, for anything that we do. We should get a partner group to launch that will take pictures of empty highways at all different <laughs> times of the days in all different places and say, look at all these empty highways. Nobody's using it. Nobody's driving. I, why are we spending $30,000 a year lane mile for maintenance on this highway that nobody uses? I, I agree. I will. Uh... <laughs> exactly. Um, and I think we covered electrification, right? And the challenge there is there's gonna be mixed use tracks and there's places like Ashland. Um, Richmond Main Street Station probably has to keep low level platforms because of freight going by. Yes. You know, okay. Um, yeah, um, you know, Richmond Main Street Station, the, the good news as part of this transforming rail program is all of the Richmond regional trains will be extended to Main Street Station, which is our downtown station. Uh, right now, uh, 18 trains serve Staples Mill, which is our suburban station. Um, four trains serve Main Street Station, um, which is our downtown station, the hub of all everything. Um, 
So all the trains will be extended to the downtown station, which is huge. Um, but it is unique that um, it is elevated. All the tracks are elevated, going both ways in and out of the station. Um, and so it is very difficult to do the necessary expansions when everything is on trestles and confined by buildings surrounding a station. So there are certainly some challenges, but um, you know we're excited that a lot of new service will be added downtown in the foreseeable future. Um, I, you know, I was hoping that Brightline would have the answer for running passenger trains and freight trains with high level platforms. And unfortunately, BNSF and UP have not accepted that answer in California. And uh, California is trying to figure out a solution um, as we speak, uh, because uh, they want to be able to have full roll on access yeah. for their yeah. single level equipment. And, and one thing I'll mention on that is, you know, Virginia uh, finished report and they're advancing a program uh, spending about $46 million. Um, and there's really no timetable for it on modernizing all of our stations. Um, so any new station in Virginia, if you build a new station, it has to ha have high level platforms, period. Um, so the new Newport News Station that's going to be coming online in a couple of years, we have high level platforms. I, I believe Norfolk has it, Roanoke has it. Um, and then any major um, improvements that they're going to do, the goal is to get every station high level platforms. That's not going to be fully possible everywhere, but the state, the state is moving in that direction to try to accomplish that. It may take a little bit longer uh, than we would like, uh, but that is something that we're keenly aware of and, and that we're supporting and advocating for as well. Excellent. Um, and I think we are at time. So thank you again. I will thank do you. one more pitch a mask. Make a donation at hsrail.org. Um, and thank you, Danny, very much for coming. And I'm thank looking you, forward Ray. to continuing to work together on the national uh, front over the next year. Excellent. Thank you, Rick. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Excellent. Thank you for the uh, people who have joined us. Goodbye.